In the early 1980s, a team of researchers led by Sue Savage Rumbaugh were struggling to teach a bonobo named Matata how to use a symbolic picture system called Yerkish to communicate. Each symbol, called a lexigram, represents one concept or object. This is the Yerkish symbol for juice, for example. Matata never really picked up on what the researchers were trying to teach her, though. She had been born in the wild, and she just didn't seem to grasp the idea that pictures could be used as abstract symbols. But what the researchers didn't realize was that someone else had been paying attention to Matata's lessons. Her adopted son, Kanzi, who had been born in captivity and accompanied Matata to all of her lessons starting at around six months old. One day while Matata was away, Kanzi started spontaneously using the Yerkish keyboard on his own. He would do things like press the signs for apple and chase and then pick up an apple and run off with it. Or he would press keys for specific foods and when the researchers took him to the refrigerator, he'd take those foods out of the refrigerator. He used the keyboard more than 120 times on that first day alone. The researchers soon realized that Kanzi had learned the signs that they had been struggling to teach his mother through just exposure with no explicit training, and he quickly mastered almost 400 signs in all. Ever since then, scholars have debated the extent to which Kanzi has language. Is his use of the keyboard just behavioral conditioning, or is it actually a type of symbolic communication? Hi, I'm Danny Heaver, PhD in Linguistics, and this channel, Linguistic Discovery, is all about the science and diversity of language. And today, we'll be talking about whether Kanzi knew language. So just how advanced was Kanzi's use of symbols? For starters, after a month or so of using the keyboard, Kanzi settled on something like standard word order. At first, he'd put signs in a random order using both combinations like hide peanut and peanut hide, but then he started consistently putting the action first and things second, regardless whether the noun was the subject or the object. What's really interesting about this is that it's actually the opposite of the word order we see in human language. Verb-first languages are very rare. Only about 8% of languages put the verb first in a sentence. Kanzi also seemed to understand many spoken English words. Here he is correctly pressing symbols on the keyboard each time he's told a word. Can you find eggs? Sherman. Egg. Good. Can you find milk? Milk? Milk. Good. How about apple? Apple. Very good. This shows that Kanzi can understand spoken English words and associate them with arbitrary symbols, kind of like the way dogs can learn the names for different types of toys. But was this just behavioral conditioning, or can Kanzi actually understand what the English words mean? The researchers decided to find out. They carefully designed an experiment that took nine months to complete, where they tested Kanzi's understanding of English against that of a two-year-old child named Aaliyah. Both Kanzi and Aaliyah were given 660 spoken instructions that required them to use objects in different ways. The person giving the instructions sat behind a one-way mirror so they couldn't see what Kanzi or Leah were doing and accidentally biased them. There were also two observers in the room that wrote down everything that Kanzi and Aaliyah did, but they were wearing headphones so that they couldn't hear the instruction. This made sure that their observations weren't biased by the instructions. They also made sure to include lots of irrelevant decoys in the environment or to combine our objects and their uses in unusual ways. They'd give an instruction like, fetch the carrots on the table in the kitchen and put them in the the bowl in the living room, and Kanzi and Aaliyah would have to ignore the other carrots in the kitchen or bowls in other rooms. The result was that Kanzi responded correctly to 74% of the instructions, while Aaliyah responded correctly to just 65. It was a great demonstration of just how sophisticated Kanzi's linguistic abilities were. Sue Savage Rumbaugh later estimated that Kanzi could understand approximately 3,000 words in total. So while Kanzi clearly didn't have a complete grasp of English grammar, it does seem like he understood some of its basic principles, like word order. By the way, if you're enjoying this video and want to learn more about the science and diversity of language, check out my newsletter at linguisticdiscovery.com. You'll get deep dives about how language works, explainers of concepts in linguistics, language profiles, reviews, and a weekly digest of all the latest news and research in linguistics. So if that sounds up your alley, head on over to linguisticdiscovery.com and check it out. So Kanzi demonstrated a far more advanced set of linguistic abilities than any other primate had demonstrated in experiments to date, despite decades of attempts. A gorilla named Coco and a a chimpanzee named Washo were both taught some basic sign language, a chimpanzee named Lana was also taught some Yerkish, and another chimpanzee named Sarah was taught a different symbol system. A third chimpanzee named Nim Chimsky was taught some American sign language, but linguist Herbert Terrace realized that Nim never initiated conversations on his own, and his utterances were highly repetitive. His longest utterance was, give orange, me give, eat orange, me eat orange, give me eat orange, give me you. It was pretty clear that Nim was only using the signs to 
to get a reward. In all of these previous studies, there was nothing that definitively showed that the primates had accomplished anything more than basic behavioral conditioning in response to human-initiated cues. Kanzi was the first non-human primate who seemed to surpass that threshold and engage in symbolic communication, even if it was very basic symbolic communication. Anthropologist Terence Deacon says in his book The Symbolic Species, Kanzi seems to have a far better sense of what is and is not relevant to symbolic and linguistic communication. He attends to the appropriate stimulus, whereas other chimps trained at older ages seem to need a lot of help just recognizing what to pay attention to. Kanzi's whole orientation seems to have been biased by his early experience. What made Kanzi different is that he was interacting with humans and learning to pay attention to human social cues practically from birth. This was an experience that the other primates in those studies lacked. Kanzi seemed to have developed what we call a theory of mind, an awareness of the mental states and intentions of others. Kanzi would point at objects, for example, which isn't something that primates naturally do in the wild. And Sue Savage Rumbaugh tells anecdotes about how Kanzi would follow her gaze when she noticed things, even in cases where Sue's dogs, for example, didn't. In one experiment designed to test Kanzi's theory of mind, researchers would hide a grape under one of three cups, then ask Kanzi, where's the grape? If the person asking the question was there when the grape had been hidden, Kanzi often wouldn't point to a cup at all. But if the person had been out of the room when the grape was hidden, Kanzi would quickly point to the right cup. Kanzi's early interactions with humans also seem to have improved his ability to perform complex tasks that require multi-step planning, so that he even demonstrated extremely rudimentary tool use. Kanzi could gather wood, build a fire, light matches, and then cook an omelet over the fire. He even roasted marshmallows. Kanzi was also an accomplished gamer. He loved playing Pac-Man, and recently the popular YouTuber Christopher Slayton partnered with the Ape Initiative to test Kanzi's abilities at Minecraft. Kanzi proved to be an adept miner, mastering basic Minecraft skills within minutes and beating every challenge they threw at him. But even though Kanzi was quite the Renaissance man, uh, Renaissance primate, his abilities were still pretty simple when compared to even young human children. His utterances showed some basic word order conventions, but nothing close to the complex sentences humans put together. Human infants typically enter the two-word stage around 18 to 24 months old, and at this point they learn basic grammatical structures like word order and semantic relationships like possession. Kanzi never really moved past this earliest part of the two-word stage. His utterances always relied heavily on interpretation and context, while humans can start relying on linguistic rules and conventions pretty early in their language acquisition process. For example, Kanzi used the symbol for strawberry as the name for the object, as a request to go where the strawberries were, or as a request to eat some strawberries, and so on. On the other hand, linguist David Gill argues that this sort of linguistic free-for-all is exactly what the earliest human languages would have been like. Before languages developed grammatical affixes, word order, or function words, humans would have relied on context and theory of mind to understand each other, just like Kanzi did. That's all you need to start slowly developing grammar. Kanzi may not have had language the way that we do, but he certainly seems to have had many of the cognitive abilities that are required for language, such as theory of mind, self-awareness, joint attention, and some type of symbolic thought. He just hadn't developed those abilities to the same extent that humans have. Kanzi showed that even though primates in the wild don't use symbolic communication, they have the cognitive capacity to do so. And humans are the same way. We don't solve differential equations or write novels in our natural hunter-gatherer state, but humans have always been biologically capable of doing so. We just had to be in the right cultural environment to bring those abilities out. The reason humans can solve differential equations isn't because our hunter-gatherer ancestors were doing advanced mathematics. It's because the intellectual abilities they developed to handle everything else in their environment could also be used for differential equations if needed. Many anthropologists and linguists these days think that this is exactly how language might have evolved. We might have repurposed other cognitive abilities we already had in order to communicate. We didn't necessarily have to evolve a specific ability for language. And Kanzi's experiences are one piece of evidence that this might be true. Thanks to Kanzi, we now know that it's possible to engage in basic symbolic communication without some sort of special language evolution. More and more research on animal communication is showing that other animals possess many of the cognitive abilities we need for language. So there may be no single ability that makes humans unique when it comes to language. But it's still the case that humans are the only species which has all of those cognitive abilities together. And we can thank Kanzi for helping us realize that. Sadly, Kanzi passed away on March 
18th, 2025 at the age of 44, which is an incredibly long life for a bonobo. Kanzi was a happy, playful individual who loved interacting with humans, and he spent his last morning happily chasing other bonobos and engaging in his daily enrichment activities. Kanzi will always be remembered for his impact on the field of linguistics, and the way his happy antics challenged an entire theoretical paradigm in the field. He helped us understand the nature of language a little better, and in doing so, helped us understand ourselves as humans a little more as well.